Okay, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this evening at Prosper's annual celebration, the Henry George Commemorative Dinner for 2024. Uh, my name is Tim Helm. I'm the Director of Research and Policy at Prosper. I'm an economist. I'm from New Zealand. You don't need to know anything else, really. Now, before we begin, we are meeting on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, so we pay our respects to their elders, past and present. Now, this dinner, this long tradition, is an occasion to celebrate the work of Prosper as an organisation and to acknowledge also the, the quite fascinating historical legacy that we are part of at Prosper. We have taken uh, great strides in recent years in bringing Georgist thought to a modern audience, and I'm excited about what we can achieve in future. It's also an occasion to, I think, remind ourselves of, if you like, the power and potential in these ideas about economic justice that we are responsible for keeping alive and making relevant today, because we are, at heart, a little different as an organisation. We're not just another think tank conducting uh, a type of values-free policy analysis or social science, taking social goals as given, although we do do a bit of that including for tax deduction purposes. But we are actually advocates for a particular ethical view, a quite compelling view on social justice. It's a position about who should get what in society, a political philosophy. And it's a position that, as I hope most of you will agree, when you look at it closely and fairly and honestly, it's a, it's a moral position that is quite irrefutable. It's, it's an undeniable moral truth that this that unequal private rights to the most public of resources being the earth is, um, well, this accepted way we run society is unfair, it's immoral. Now, therefore, because we are in the business of changing minds on morality, we sometimes stand up and say strange and controversial things, such as land ownership is slavery over the cadastra. And this is weird, right? And loses us some friends. But you also know that in your heart of hearts, we are speaking to some shocking but undeniable truth about morality in our world. It's inconvenient and it's challenging, but it's undeniable that the way we structure land in society is really messed up. So although I'm an economist and I do love the puzzles in our discipline, it's not really at heart the, the dry social science that gets me up in the morning, but it is this compelling vision of a better world that Prosper is charged with uh, pursuing, that we carry forward. This world where the bits of the earth that your ancestors happened to corner at the expense of mine, and maybe with a gun, uh, are instead shared by all, at least economically. So Prosper is an excellent vehicle in that respect for someone who gives a shit, and that's an approach I highly commend. We are pursuit, in pursuit of radical change, right? Let's be honest. We are respectfully and maybe playfully in pursuit of quite radical change to people's minds. And I do get a twinkle in my eye when I see others pursuing social change the playful way. Maybe you know who you are. And perhaps by shocking the neighbours and breaching a few pieties, you are shuffling along how society sees itself. Now this dinner is, uh, well, it's a long tradition. We've hosted this for 133 years, the tradition beginning to commemorate George's visit, Henry George's visit to Australia in 1890. And tonight, rather than just noting that and speaking to what we're doing in the present, I actually would like to dwell for a moment on the significance of the Georgist ideas to contextualise what we will hear from our keynote speaker and to explain why we are awarding our writing prize to the recipient. So some of you will be uh, a little less familiar with the ideas we call Georgism, so I'm going to give you a quick summary. Henry George was an American journalist. Uh, he lived in the, in the late 19th century. He was a DIY economist. He rivaled Karl Marx for influence at that time, and he was several orders of magnitude more coherent as an economist than Marx. And he wrote a great deal about economic justice, including a steaming bestseller called Progress and Poverty, which explained how it was the innate 
monopoly in land, not the power of capitalists, that was ultimately responsible for the exploitation of the poor, of the, the workers or of the landless, depending how you see it. And that book and his character kicked off this movement to share the value of land that we call the Georgist political philosophy. And the movement spread across the globe. And so to preserve the existing economic order, it had to be quashed. And those ideas had to be erased at great expense to our intellectual heritage by way of debasing economics into this sort of incoherent mess we call neoclassical economics, where there is no distinction between this building and the land it sits on and where everybody somehow gets exactly what they deserve at every point in time, and nothing can ever really be improved on. And that last idea comes from the, the Italian fascist Pareto. Now, we will award a prize tonight to somebody who told this story of the debasing of economics very, very neatly. Uh, the Georges movement ran far and wide, including to Australia, where many of the uh, social institutions, many of the policies we take for granted today are actually relics of that history and that history of thought. But in the face of this threat, Henry George's ideas had to be erased from history, and that began in the US universities, which were at the time really the, the toys of the land barons and were fairly overtly engaged in, in class warfare. So in summary, this history, if you're not familiar with it already, uh, the history of these Georgist ideas um, and their erasure is why you've never heard of the most popular, famous economist of the 19th century. Because in modern terms, he got cancelled. And if you want to s understand why, we can summarise what frightened the horses with the title of an article in Wired magazine earlier this year. And that title was, Land Ownership Makes No Sense. And that is quite a claim, given what we're used to. And this was essentially George's radical idea, that to let people free or trade free of tax with complete liberty, but with this weird... Western tradition where you get to own land you didn't make, effectively abolished, and abolished by way, in George's view, of hefty land taxation. So you can own what you make in this ethic, but you don't own people or land. The control of land can be private, but the benefit must be socialised through tax or, as we'll hear from our keynote, other means. And this idea really was beautifully American. That's how I see it. You have capitalism let rip utter freedom to trade, but from a starting point of all men and women created equal with equal rights to the earth. And in that way, it rejected the, the tradition of uh, the European tradition of the landed aristocracy. So sitting beside the US Constitution and the US civil rights movement, we can see uh, Henry George's ideas as, as American radical idealism at its best of an ingenuity in service of a moral principle. And George's proposal took the fancy of some Australians who set us up for today and with their endowment of money and ideas, uh, we at Prosper can keep telling this story and trying to make it relevant to the, the world we live in. That's the potted summary of how we got here tonight. That's what we do at Pros Prosper and that's really enough for now from me. Um, it's time for dinner and I will interrupt you later to award our uh, annual writing prize, the E.J. Craigie Award, and to introduce our keynote. But for now, welcome to the 2024 Henry George Commemorative Dinner. Uh, enjoy your company and enjoy your dinner. Thank you. So uh, we're coming to the, the, the main course of the evening, if you like. So at Prosper, we have, for the last 10 years, awarded a, a prize, the E.J. Craigie Award, for the most compelling or articulate or otherwise worthy piece of writing on Georgist themes by, well, really anybody. Uh, this is the E.J. Craigie Writing Award, named after South Australian politician Edward John Craigie. And our past winners have included Waleed Ali last year, uh, Adam Creighton from The Australian, Jessica Irvine, formerly of Fairfax, not sure where she is now, and seven other people. Now, we received actually a record number of nominations for this year's award, which we take as a positive sign. We had nominations for pieces by former Prosper staffer Emily Sims, Cathy Sherry, uh, Sydney planning lawyer, uh, Yimby Melbourne, Alan Kohler, and there were a few others. But by unanimous agreement of Prosper's board, unanimous agreement of Prosper's board, we're awarding tonight's prize to Gareth Hutchins of the ABC. And Gareth, uh, in a really magnificent three-part series, laid out 
and made contemporary and jargon-free and relevant a whole range of interesting Georgist ideas and history. And so across these three pieces, which I recommend you look for in the ABC, he asked three questions. The first being, if we taxed land properly, we'd have billions of extra dollars to fund big tax cuts elsewhere, so why don't we do it? That's one question. And that question summarises in a sentence what Cameron Murray and I took many more words to say. The second piece, what do land tax monopoly and Australia have in common? I think the answer was uh, Henry George, the legacy of Henry George. And the final question, uh, why did land disappear from some economic models? If you were here last year, you'll recall Ross Garno speaking on the development of neoclassical economics and the regrets, really, of uh, even some of those involved. And in Gareth's third piece, he laid out the story I just previously told you of the erasure of land from economics as this deliberate strategy to neuter, to neuter Henry George. So in one of Gareth's pieces, he wrote this. Have a read of the message on this old billboard. The billboard picture reads, everybody works but the vacant lot. You might be familiar with it. As Gareth said, what thoughts occur to you when you read that? In today's context, where something deeply wrong with Australia's economic management has driven property prices to socially destructive levels, that billboard carries a sting. Why does our government insist on punishing effort by overtaxing the earned income from work, investment and innovation, while rewarding rent-seeking and speculation by undertaxing the unearned income from private ownership of land, natural resources and monopolistic advantage? And, and I love that a journalist can make that a question. It's a monologue and a question. It's beautiful. Thank you, Gareth. This is so clear, this point, and it is so self-evident, and yet it is in our media landscape and in our, in our public debate, it's to speak so plainly of really our tax stupidity is somewhat well, it, it's sacrilegious. It's a little bit of a taboo to call it out so clearly, yet Gareth Hutchins in his pieces did just that, uh, and he's putting me out of a job. So I'm, I'm really pleased to bribe him into silence by awarding him this year's E.J. Craigie Writing Award. So please put your hands together for Gareth Hutchins of the ABC. Can I just say one thing, by the way? Yeah, I just, you grab a microphone. It was just, um, where's Raina? There she is over there. It was when Raina came to Canberra, uh, had a coffee, finally met face to face, she just asked me, so when are you going to start talking about the tax mix switch? Mm. And I mean, I had been planning on doing this for ages and it made me feel quite guilty. But that was the thing. I went home and started going, okay, let's do this. I mean, Ross Garner gave that fantastic speech last year, which I've reread more than any other speech. Um, uh, Ken Henry has also been giving some fantastic speeches. And they're all pointing in the same direction, it seems to me. Uh, and Prosper Australia, as I was saying before, the older you get, the more you realise that everything is attached to land. Uh, all of our problems can come down to this element. And it, it just seems that Prosper is in the right moment. You've been sitting here telling people the message for decades. Um, and hopefully the time has come. Thank you. See, putting me out of a job. <laughs> Thank you. Sort of. Come back next year as MC. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, to the main event. Now, at this dinner, we, yes, we remind ourselves of the, the moral vision of Prosper, but we also push along this work. Uh, we push along our vision of the good society by hearing from a speaker who has earned their place in the, uh, this historical legacy of thought by the quality of their thinking, the quality of their ideas, and by helping to carry Georgist themes to the wider world. Uh, I'm pleased we have with us tonight several former keynote speakers, including Brendan Coates, Cameron Murray, Catherine Cashmore, and Brian Kavanagh. And apologies if I miss anybody. I'm going to try a little wildly to contextualise tonight's speech by expressing the radicalism of the Georgist idea one more way. 
and respectable words, radical idea. So bear with me. So we, we all agree false binaries are the bane of politics, yes? They give us uh, a tribalism in political discourse. They give us fractious and unproductive debate. So you are, you are left, so therefore I am right. And you are pro something, so I must be anti. I have to dis, you know, discuss with, with people who are pro housing. Am I anti? If someone is oppressed, someone is an oppressor. These kind of binaries are terrible. These are these stupid trenches that hold us in. Uh, they inhibit agreement. These binaries just bind up our political discourse and they lead to a political inertia because we can't find common ground on a binary. And we see them in economics, but we prefer them a little bit fancy, these binaries, and we call them trade-offs. Uh, it's a fancy binary. There can be no good without some bad. A bit less categorical than a political binary, but just as depressing. And we economists love them because we get to use both hands. And we wring those hands together to explain how hard it all is to change anything. And people, well, the status quo also therefore loves trade-offs because doing anything seems inordinately difficult when you're focused on the cost. There's always a loser and everything is a compromise. And that makes... This focus on trade-offs in so much discourse, and especially economic discourse, which I'm involved in, so stifling of progress. It's just as stifling as a false political binary. So if you like, just like in the, the Hegelian dialectic, we get nowhere in society until the, the thesis and the antithesis become a synthesis and we move beyond a binary, a one-dimensional you know, tug of war over ideas and objectives, and we move to action in some other direction entirely. And there's a Georgist writer, Mason Gaffney, and, and as he once wrote, the relentless focus on trade-offs by economists obscures or maybe hides the possibility of reconciliation, which in normal language means having our cake and eating it too. And this was the radical power in Henry George's proposal. It shows how we may relieve trade-offs everywhere and break binaries by showing us the, the, the class who silently benefit from setting up these types of contracts, these, these trade-offs, these binaries, setting up these conflicts and enjoying the political inertia that results. For example, Marx says, or well, labour is at war with capital. And George says, well, no, these two have mutual interests if we tax land. If we want higher wages and we want higher business profits, that is possible if we tax land instead of production. If we want economic efficiency and equity in income distribution, which economists so often pitch as at odds, we can tax land and uh, tax land and untax labour. If we want a, an attractive business environment and high quality public goods, we can tax land and its uplift. And if we want more un well, more employment and we want economic stimulus without extra inflation, we can tax land and see more of it used. So capturing the rent of land is a solution that breaks so many trade-offs, breaks so many binaries. And we are told so often today, it's, it's recurrent and it's infusing our political discourse that we cannot have good things. We cannot have affordable housing and keep our built heritage and environment. We cannot cut the economic pie more fairly without making that pie smaller. And whenever you hear this call to paralysis, I think you need to, it's the opposite of a call to action, which is a campaigning thing I learned the other day. I call this a call to paralysis, the incessant focus on the trade-offs and the costs. Follow uh, the money, follow the dollars, follow the ideas back to uh, a quiet beneficiary class, rent seekers who are unprepared to lose privilege, their privilege of extracting from the host which is society. And I see this impulse towards sacrifice and the discussion of trade-offs, this very dismal instinct serves that interest. And I see the radicalism of George as being that, that the insight that so many trade-offs and binaries come about because we tie our hands by respecting this very disrespectable institution of uh, private property rights to the earth. Now tonight we will hear what a place can achieve by breaking these old rules about property rights to land. And I think in Australia, if we are to make progress, it will come from <coughs> choosing to finally reject some old constraint and break some old piety. It won't come from continuing the path of least resistance, the end point of which is just standing still. 
Now, Singapore's success is founded on this heresy that we break private property rights to land. And so, please let me introduce our speaker. So, Professor Sokyong Pang is the Celia Mo Chair of Economics at the Singapore Management University. A scholar of urban economics, she obtained her PhD from Harvard in 1989 and has published widely since then in the areas of housing and transport economics. She's an expert in housing finance, boom-bust cycles, value capture, and Singapore's unique housing system and public development agencies. She's the author of three books, uh, Policy Innovations for Affordable Housing in Singapore, Housing Finance Systems, and Housing Markets in Urban Transportation. She's also written uh, many book chapters and journal articles on housing and transport economics. She's been a consultant to the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and uh, various government organisations and has been a board member on a wide range of organisations, especially in Singapore. For the first time, Prosper's brought across a speaker from overseas and uh, uh, I've been really privileged to listen to Sokyong on our tour uh, in recent days. I'm now really pleased that you get to hear the same story, you get the opportunity to hear from her. So I'd like you to now uh, welcome Sokyong, who will deliver the 2024 Henry George Commemorative Address on the topic of value capture and affordable housing in Singapore. So please welcome Professor Pang. Good evening everyone. Thank you Tim for that kind introduction and a big thank you to the Executive Committee of Prosper Australia for inviting me to this event tonight. I'm a huge fan of Henry George and I'm very honoured to be invited to give this 133rd Henry George Commemorative Address. The topic of my talk will be on the role of value capture in Singapore's affordable housing policies, and also about how Singapore's land and housing policies align with the ideas of Henry George. Now, let me first summarise George's main economic ideas. In 1879, Henry George, an American political economist, published his seminar book, Progress and Poverty, setting out the rationale for a tax on land rent. George was also a strong advocate for free trade and for no taxes on wages and capital. He believed in provision of utilities and transport with rights of way for free or at marginal cost. He endorsed taxes on negative externalities and advocated for competition and taxes on monopoly rents, including mineral rents. His, first, his best known proposal was a single tax on the value of land. It was the secret, he believed, that would transform the little village into the great city. This secret, value capture, has contributed in no small measure to the transformation of Singapore from a colonial city to the global city that it is today. To explain the role of value capture in Singapore's progress, I will first provide some background information on Singapore and its housing sector. I will then take you on a journey back to the 1960s to show how we establish our present institutional arrangements for land and housing. I will next describe how housing policies have evolved over the past six decades in response to changing contexts. Finally, I will conclude with the fiscal implications of successful value capture. Where relevant, I will indicate how Singapore's policies align with George's view. I will use Singapore dollars in my talk, and the exchange rate is about one Singapore dollar to about one fifteen Australian dollars um, currently. Okay, first, um, some background. Singapore's unusual housing policies must be understood in the context of its small land area. It is both a city and an independent republic of six million people with a land area of only 700 square kilometres. Besides housing, it must also find space for all the requirements of a normal functioning country, which includes commercial and, in um, and industrial areas, uh, the gateway ports and airports, military installations and training grounds, water catchment and parks. <coughs> to, put, to put this in perspective, Singapore's population is comparable to Melbourne's and Sydney's. Melbourne's land area is about 14 times larger, and Sydney's land area is 17 times larger um, than Singapore's. So Singapore's land scarcity explains land and housing solutions 
that will appear drastic for other countries. So this, but despite its small size, Singapore has thrived economically. The US Heritage Foundation ranks Singapore as the world's freest economy. There are no trade tariffs and capital markets are open. The IMD World Competitive Center ranks Singapore as the most competitive economy in the world. It is often described as a small and efficient state with light taxes, simple regulations, and open doors. However, this description doesn't quite capture the reality of its land and housing sectors, where there's extensive government intervention and regulation. But it's these policies that resulted in affordable home ownership for 90% of resident households. Um, because of our land constraint, the dominant housing type are all high density flats built by the Housing and Development Board, or the HDB for short. It's a government agency, and HDB housing comprises 71% of our housing stock currently. Private condominiums, also high density, comprise about a quarter, and the rest of landed housing only about 5%. 94% of HDB's housing has been sold to households on 99-year leasehold basis. And in Singapore, the most common house type it's a four-room HDB flat, about 970 square feet. We often use the medium house price to medium income ratio as a housing affordability indicator. And the medium market price of a HDB four-room flat is about $600,000, which is about 4.7 times the medium annual household income in Singapore. So first-time homeowners however, are able to pay, purchase a new HDB flat at a much lower price. So how did Singapore achieve these affordable housing outcomes despite its land scarcity? So um, a bit of history now. To answer this question, uh, I need to take you back to the 1960s when Singapore was trying to find its way. It, uh, Singapore had been founded as a British trading post in 1819 and was granted internal self-government in 1959. The People's Action Party, led by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, won a landslide victory with an election manifesto to deliver improvements in housing, education, jobs, and to merge with Malaya. The PAP has been remained in power since. You haven't had a change in government. And in 1960, the new government established the HDB to clear slums and build housing. Within the first five years, HDB built over 50,000 units. HDB eventually became the largest housing developer in Singapore. There are more than 1 million HDB flats, housing 78% of the resident population. The new government expected the city to be transformed rapidly and land prices to rise correspondingly. In 1964, it introduced a development charge, a form of betterment tax. In the reading of the bill in the Legislative Assembly then, the Minister for National Development justified the new development charge thus. With a view to securing for the state the increase in value of land brought about by community development and not through the efforts of the landowner, any written permission granted which allows development over what is normally permitted in the present master plan will attract a development charge. This betterment tax is completely in line with George's argument that to take land values for public purposes is not really to impose a tax, but to take for public purposes a value created by the community. Well, in the 1960s, the HDB was faced with the major challenge of acquiring land for building public housing. Without land, there would be no housing. Well, this land problem it faced was solved in a rather unexpected way. In 1963, the government had led Singapore into a merger with Malaya, forming the Federation of Malaysia. The merger was short-lived due to the disagreements over the future direction of the Federation. So on 9 August 1965, Singapore was expelled from the Federation. Well, to describe Independence Day, as not a happy occasion would be an understatement. Um, we had, the country saw Mr. Lee Kuan Yew unable to hold back his tears in front of the media. The crisis didn't, however, afford the government 
the opportunity to change the rules on land acquisition. In the words of Mr. Lee, we therefore took overriding powers to acquire land at low cost, which was in breach of one of the fundamentals of British constitutional law, the sanctity of property. But that had to be overcome because the sanctity of the society to preserve itself was greater. So we acquired it at sub-economic rates. Okay. Um, that was in August 1965, the breakup with Malaysia. By December that same year, a new constitution was ready. Parliament adopted all the provisions of the Malaysian constitution, which was handed over by the British, uh, except for Article 13, concerning the rights to property and to adequate compensation in the event of compulsory acquisition. So the founding fathers of Singapore decided to leave out the article uh, from our new constitution. The government then took the bold step of passing the Land Acquisition Act in 1966, which gave the state and its agencies broad powers to acquire land, not just for public purposes, but also for any residential, commercial, or industrial purposes, and without recourse to the courts. Landowners cannot object to decisions, and appeals on compensation can be made to an appeals board, but not to the courts. Although most people would have a problem with the justice of such a draconian land law, it is completely consistent with George's view that the recognition of individual proprietorship of land is the denial of the natural rights of other individuals. It is wrong, it is a wrong which must show itself in the inequitable division of wealth. And George often quoted line, we must make land common property. So a crucial aspect of land acquisition then was fixing the price of acquired land. What compensation should landowners get? In earlier debates prior to independence, Mr. Lee had made his views clear that the price paid on acquisition for public purposes should not be higher than what the land would have been worth had the government not contemplated development generally in the area. However, even after independence and after the enactment of the new Land Acquisition Act, the issue of compensation for acquired land continued to be contentious and appealed to the Appeals Board. Finally, to resolve the gridlock regarding compensation, in 1973, the government amended the law to acquire land at its value fixed as of November 30th, 1973, or its market value, whichever was lower. This was based on the principle that private landowners should not stand to profit from an increase in land value brought about by economic development and the infrastructure paid for with public funds. George's view on compensation of land rents were even more draconian. To quote George, if the land belonged to the people, why continue to permit landowners to take the rent or compensate them in any manner for the loss of rent? Now, what does the common law allow to the innocent possessor when the land for which he paid his money is adjudged rightfully to belong to another? Nothing at all. Okay, that's, that's from George. Okay. Um, well, as property ownership increased over time, and after much land had already been acquired by the state, the statutory date of, to determine price was amended on three occasions after 1973. So in 1986, in 1992, and in 1996, uh, the statutory price was adjusted um, to those first January of that particular year. Eventually, in 2007, the government shifted to market rate compensation for land acquisition, recognizing the changing economic landscape. But by then, the Draconian Land Acquisition Act, together with land reclamation, had resulted in state ownership of land increasing from 44% of total land in 1960 to over 90% of land in Singapore by 2005. So the, the government has basically taken over the monopoly rights of land. Beyond state land ownership, housing policy and urban development have been complemented by land use planning. Plans are created by a single planning authority, the Urban Development Redevelopment Board, for the entire city-state, rather than by local, compartmentalized municipalities. The concept plan, we had our first one in 1971, guides long-term land use planning to align with social economic environment plans and is reviewed every 10 years. 
The master plan is reviewed every five years, and each review is now forward-looking and reflects land use intentions. The plan guides private property owners and developers as to permissible land use and densities. The betterment charge first introduced in 1964 is levied at the point of planning approval. The tax is 70% of the land value increment arising from the grant in planning permission or variation of development control for land development. A table of applicable rates for the betterment charge is um, made public by the chief valuable, valuer every six months, comes out on 1st of March and 1st of September, and, this, um, and the table reflects uh, current um, market values for space. And now I will move on to describe the Singapore housing finance system, which is also rather unique. Home ownership was considered superior to rental public housing as it would give citizens a stake in the country. This was particularly important in the context of nation building in post-independent Singapore. In 1964, the HDB has started a home ownership program. However, initial demand was not strong. People were not familiar with deposits and mortgage payments, and many households could not even afford the initial deposit that was required. So in 1968, the government transformed the Central Provident Fund, a pension scheme left by the British, um, and meant for retirement financing, into a housing provident fund. Um, employees and employers had to make substantial com compulsory contributions to the employee's account in the fund. The kind of current contribution rates are 17% of which for employers and 20% for employee, for a total of 37%. Okay? Of that 37%, 6% is allocated for retirement, 8% for health-related expenses, and 23% can be used for housing, down payment, and mortgage payments. Most of HDB households will be servicing their mortgage payments entirely from their CPF savings with no cash outlay. In 2022, the latest year that I could find data on, contributions to the CPF amounted to 6.5% of GDP, while withdrawals for housing down payment and mortgage payments amounted to 3.2% of GDP. The CPF does not manage the funds, uh, not like the super here, but purchase government bonds. The government bond, uh, in turn deposits the funds with our sovereign wealth funds to be invested. Hence, by 1968, a sustainable framework for affordable home ownership had been put in place. The HDB became the largest real estate developer and, and housing finance bank. The government finances the deficits of the HDB, which supply flats to citizens. The government also provides loans to HDB to make mortgage loans to home buyers. The HDB mortgage rate, interest rate, is 2.6%. Um, there's a flat rate that uh, applies across all households. Um, so there are no subprime mortgage rates in Singapore. Uh, CPF savings can now be also be used for private housing purchase, and commercial banks can also provide housing loans for HDB owners. As CPF savings cannot be used for rental payment, home ownership becomes a default choice for most households. Um, the HDB completes in the part last uh, decade, on average, about 20,000 flats a year. This corresponds closely to the number of first-time marriages each year, so that each, new, uh, each household um, at a point of marriage is, can expect to own a HDB flat. The HDB's building program led to a rapid increase in home ownership rates in the 1970s and 1980s, a 60 percentage point increase over two decades, from about 30% in 1970 to 90% by 1990. In the 1990s, with the housing problem solved, the HDB resale market was deregulated. After a minimum occupation period of five years, the owner is permitted to sell the flat to citizens or permanent residents, households, who are not subject to the same income ceilings as first-time buyers. However, a household can own only one HDB flat at any point in time. And the owner of a HDB flat may also choose to rent out their flat after the minimum occupancy period of five years. 
So this was a framework that was put in place for affordable housing. Um, over time, over the decades, the system has had to adapt to changing context. Um, HDB prices is new flats now. They are known as built-to-order flats because um, there's a ballot that's conducted after announcement of a launch of um, HDB housing. And the, the prices are made known um, at the point of the launch. The successful household gets um, the, the flats usually completed about four years later. So the household income ceiling to be eligible to buy a new flat from the HDB is 14000 a month. And that covers almost all first-time homeowners. So um, there are three sets of prices, actually, for HDB flats in the same locality. Okay, there's a market for resale flat that's active, and uh, the market prices are often significantly higher than the prices that the HDB will sell the flats for. So the HDB, when launching new flats, have a, what I call a sticker price. This is a price for this range of room type, flat types, from two rooms to five rooms. Um, and the government actually will provide housing grants for first-time home buyers um, with a grant amount dependent, dependent on factors such as household income, new or resale flat purchase, and proximity to parents. Um, if you're living with parents, you get 30,000. If you are living four kilometers from your parents, you get another 20,000. And uh, households above the medium income, ha medium household in income in Singapore would pay the sticker price. Households below the medium income in Singapore would pay um, lower prices at, um, based on how much grants they receive. So a lowest income level household at below 1,000 far per month would get an additional by then 80,000 grants, 80,000 in, in grants from the government to purchase whether a new flat or a resale flat. So um, there's a sticker price, there's the price as net, net price after grants, and then there's a the market resale price. So um, if you compare the market resale price with the net prices that households would pay, there is for each household, and on average, a 300,000 discount from market prices when buying a new flat from the HDB. So this is about two and a half years of the annual medium household income that each household in a sense, have a right or an entitlement to. The HGV's pricing approach is to look at household income across different levels, establish affordable prices for flat buyers, and then makes, that, makes the sticker prices known. So generally, HGV's house prices are four to five times the household incomes of buyers for each particular flat type. So um, with 80% of the resident population staying in HDB flats, there's no social stigma to stay in public housing. Um, in fact, there is mobility from HDB to private and from private homeowners who, wanted, who want to downsize um, in retirement to HDB flats um, and would pay the market rates for resale. So George also understood the psychological effect of charity versus right. So to quote George, the truth is that anything that injures self-respect, degrades, does harm, Anything that injures self-respect degrades and does harm. But if you give it as a right, as something to which every citizen is entitled to, it does not degrade. So George also believed that a part of the wealth produced in every community would go to the community as a whole to be distributed in public benefits to all its members. It's also from progress and poverty. So we can ask the question, what is of public benefit to all members? And in Singapore, other than public goods and married goods, public benefit has been defined to include affordable housing, inclusive neighbourhoods, public amenities and infrastructure. So um, besides providing affordable housing, the HDB also promotes socially inclusive neighbourhoods. Singapore's citizen population is multiracial, comprising 76% Chinese, 15% Malays, 8% Indians. So racially segregated neighbourhoods were common up to the 1960s. In the 1970s, the HDB mixed different races in the new housing estates with allocating flats. However, a trend of regrouping through the resale market became evident by the 1980s. Um, there's a preference for, I think, racial... Um, uh, to, to live amongst those that uh, are of similar race. And the government intervened then with race quotas. So for example, 
when the Chinese limit has been reached at 84% in a particular block, HDB block, or 87% in a particular neighbourhood, a Malay seller is required to sell to another Malay household. An Indian seller is required to sell to another Indian household. So these were the rules that were put in place in order to ensure that HDB blocks and neighbourhoods remain racially uh, uh, inclusive. And to find out whether the block or the neighbourhood has reached that quota cap, uh, you can just go online at the inter uh, on the internet and you know indicate which block, which address, and the, the information will come out as to whether that block has actually busted their particular race quota. Okay, so um, we have an active resale market and HDB rental market as well. Quotas are now also introduced for permanent residents and also for non-citizen tenants. So besides racial integration, the HDB also integrates different income groups in its estates and towns through um, having a mix of flat sizes, a whole range of flat sizes, including rental flats are uh, usually planned uh, uh, within blocks and within neighbourhoods. So recently, we're increasing incidences of million dollar resale HDB flats in some prime locations. The government now has also stepped in to introduce a three-tier classification system so for flats in prime locations and plus location, the, there will be higher subsidies so that to ensure that the uh, median, uh, middle and low income households can afford to purchase a flat there. And the higher subsidies will come with tighter resale conditions, a minimum stay of five years rather than five, year, uh, five a subsidy clawback upon resale, and the buyer of the, HD, of the resale flat must also meet the same income eligibility conditions as households applying for new HDB flats. So this has just been put in place um, this year. The three-tier classification system was announced last year by the Prime Minister. So this is to ensure that the prime locations in Singapore will continue to see mixed income neighbourhoods and not become the, uh, uh, the places where only the more wealthy households could afford. So in, in addition to um, the public benefits beyond housing, the public benefits of value extend beyond housing. Um, many of you have seen the skyline of Singapore. Um, now it's dominated. The downtown skyline has this 360 hectare Marina Bay with the Marina Bay Sands and the new financial district. And this provides an excellent example of value capture. Um, land reclamation and public investment in utilities and transport infrastructure at the Marina Bay cost the government about $8 billion by 2009. But this amount of infrastructure investment has more than, has more than re been recouped by the government from land sales proceeds of just a few strategic sites, including the Marina Bay Sands and the Marina Bay Financial Centre. Um, besides, um, public amenities and utility. Uh, the Marina Bay is also a reservoir that is much needed by Singapore. Um, value capture has helped finance the extensive MRT network, which, uh, which has a cumulative capital cost of over 100 billion Singapore dollars today. So real infrastructure enables higher density developments, thus expanding the capacity of the country to increase its population. In turn, land sales near or integrated with stations have provided opportunities um, for value capture to government land sales for housing and commercial developments. Um, I now turn to the issue of housing price stability. Um, we often hear about housing booms and bus cycles. It is, um, it is well known in the housing literature. Um, and in 2009, um, when we experienced the failures of the US subprime mortgage market, which led to a global financial crisis, uh, Singapore had to deal with the US um, quantitative easing and low interest rate environment because our capital markets are open, and the serious inflationary implications for our asset markets. So the Singapore government had to had devised numerous policy tools over the, the, um, since then to maintain stable housing prices. Between 2000 and 2023, that's over a 24-year period, uh, increases in HDB resale prices, the price indices at least, and the private house price indices have not exceeded increases in medium household incomes. So the trends have been very similar. 
um, prices have, uh, housing prices have gone up, but at the same rate as um, the medium household incomes. And this is only possible because of numerous rounds of anti-speculation um, interventions by the government. We call them cooling measures. Okay? There were 16 rounds of market cooling measures between 2009 and 2023. So every time the house prices are detected to be running away, uh, another round of cooling measures is announced by the government. So the anti-speculation measures include tightening mortgage rate, loan conditions, um, um, total debt service ratio, loan to value ratios, and raising transaction taxes for uh, foreign buyers and for investors, um, not for first time owners, they're not affected, but for investors in uh, uh, property, in, on housing uh, properties. So George had was, uh, also had made a lot of observations about land speculation, driving booms and bus cycles. Uh, in response to population growth, increased densities, and productivity improvements. And he had identified land speculation as a true cause of industrial depression. So in my own lifetime, I have observed the property-related cause of Singapore's first recession in the 1980s, when we uh, increased CPI rates by too much and uh, had an overbuilding uh, by the HDB. Um, then there was a the collapse of the Japanese real estate bubble, the Asian financial crisis in 1997, which was very much property related, the global financial crisis, and now China's evolving real estate crisis. And it is now widely accepted that macro prudential policies have a part to play in macroeconomic, um, in, a, in a macroeconomic toolkit. Most central banks, the IMF and the Bank for International Settlements, all have units monitoring house price developments closely. So to maintain price stability, it's not just about trying to, trying to curb the demand side. Um, housing supply is critical. The HDB supplies flats to meet the demand for new households. The government is also the main supplier of land for private housing development. The government land sales program. We have a, um, the land sales program is announced every six months, and state land is sold on a long-term lease of not more than 99-year lease through a tender process to private developers. And I want to actually uh, give the details of a particular scheme under the government land sales method, which is to, for a middle-income housing scheme, known as the executive condominium scheme. Here, um, to be eligible, the household monthly income has to be below 16,000 per month, which is, comp uh, which is higher than the HDB's income ceiling of 14,000. So land is sold by competitive tendering. The private developer designs, prices, and markets the development to eligible buyers. And the development becomes private housing in phases. After five years of occupancy, the housing can be sold to Singaporeans and permanent residents. After 10 years, it can be sold to foreigners as well and becomes the equivalent of private sector condominiums. So in a sense, this is a phase privatization of a higher level uh, housing scheme that is uh, driven by the government. Uh, executive condominiums comprise about 2% of the total housing stock now. So on this matter of land acquisition, government land acquisition and then sale through a bidding process, George has also considered that as an option. He, has, he had considered formally confiscating all the land and formally letting it out to the highest bidders I mean, he was really ahead of his time, um, and as an option for value capture. However, George felt that doing so would involve a needless shock to present customs and habits of thought, and a needless extension of government machinery, which should be avoided. He felt that it was not necessary to confiscate land, it was only necessary to confiscate rent. So Singapore, a newly independent nation in the 1960s, were not constrained by these entrenched customs and habits of thought and saw land acquisition as a more efficient way to achieve desired social and economic goals. So now I turn to the fiscal implications of all that Singapore does in the land and housing space. How should value capture policies be designed? George, single tax as a solution to inequality may not be sufficient and will be difficult to implement for most jurisdictions. The question of increasing inequality, of which George was greatly concerned about, 
has been much discussed since the publication of Thomas Piketty's book on capital in the 21st century, about in 2014, 10 years ago. A few authors, such as Ron Lay and others, have shown that housing wealth is the main driver of wealth inequality since the mid 20th century. The main beneficiaries of recent increases in returns have been homeowners. If housing is primarily responsible for, the wealth in, for wealth inequality, it follows that policy action should center on redesigning land and housing policies. A recent article by a group of French economists shows that a uniform land tax is the best tax to reduce inequalities of welfare between capitalists and worker tenants. But as taxing land raises implementation issues, the authors propose considering richer tax schemes, such as combining distortive instruments to mimic the impact of, non of a non-distortive instrument. For example, a rent tax supplemented by a structure subsidy does a most as well as a land tax in improving social welfare. Because we are always concerned about how to separate out the capital component from the land component when you do property taxation. So what this group of French economists have suggested is that, well, implement a rent, a property tax, but return part of the tax through a structured subsidy. So uh, that's combining two distortive instruments to mimic a non-distortive instrument. So the array of instruments and designing this range of value capture instruments is wide. The OECD, together with the Lincoln Institute, have recently prepared a global companion of land capture instruments and policies. Uh, in a lecture I delivered in 2015, mm -hmm. I showed how Singapore's housing policies have led to a more equitable distribution of housing wealth. In fact, the ideal wealth distribution um, that Piketty had actually proposed. So Singapore has used a cocktail of instruments for value capture and for value distribution. The government plays a strategic role as a land use planner and a placemaker, creating the conditions for value increase. It is dominant on the supply side in both supplying housing as well as land for private housing development. On the demand side sits a large pension housing scheme and generous housing subsidies for households to buy their first property. Progressive ta transaction taxes and progressive property taxes are used both to discourage speculation, to, dis to stabilize the housing market, and to tax wealth. The system is not perfect. There are wipeouts and windfalls from land and housing policies, which can be inequitable. But overall, the system has allowed for value capture and distribution. So what is the cost of housing subsidi subsidies for the government? In 2023, um, the government provided grants of about 5.4 billion to the HDB, which is about 1% of our GDP. So about 1% of GDP appears go to the HDB for providing um, affordable housing to um, citizens. However, if we dive deeper into the HDB's financial statements, the HDB paid the equivalent amount of 5.4 billion to the Singapore Land Authority to purchase land for its developments. So in fact, the HDB co uh, covers its construction administrative costs through um, the revenue it collects for housing. So what is given to the HDB by the Treasury is essentially collected back in land sales receipts. Um, in, the, in the estimated 2024 budget for this year, about 50% of government revenue can be associated with land value capture and uh, Pigouvian taxes, of which taxes from motor vehicles are significant. So on the um, value capture side, we have the taxes on motor vehicles, stamp duties, betterment taxes, property taxes, land value receipts, um, and investment income from the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, the land sales revenue, estimated to be about 30 billion, comprised 90% of total re revenue, is channeled into the government reserves and investment incomes from the reserves that are invested by our sovereign wealth funds contribute to the operating income uh, of the government. So in conclusion, um, Singapore's poli policy makers from a time of independence recognize the huge importance of value capture to jumpstart the economy and to provide housing. 
Their observations on the need to capture and earn land value increments, the ne negative impacts of land speculation, and the need for the state to make land common property parallel George's view. The actual policies that were implemented differ differed for good reasons. To quote Mr. Lee, if there was one formula for our success, it was that we were constantly studying how to make things work or how to make them work better. It was, I was never a prisoner of any theory. What guided me were reason and reality. And that pragmatic approach had led him to um, solutions that actually were reflective of um, George's uh, view as expressed in progress and poverty. Land and housing policies and their market prices play an important role in determining a country's wealth and income distributions. Singapore's experience is a demonstration of how strategic land value capture, government supply of housing, integrating housing with retirement savings, and careful regulation of the property market can lead to a system that provides affordable housing, enabling growth with equity. So this is a significant achievement given its severe land constraints. Well, thank you for your attention. Well, I have omitted many details in my presentation, but I hope to have given you a broad overview of how our land and housing system works. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sok Yong. In almost every respect, the institutions are so different to Australia's. You point out there's a kind of accidental Georgism to uh, Lee Kuan Yew's decisions and the decisions of the Singaporean government and that it persists in a way that the countries trying to implement higher land taxes haven't been able to sustain this. So there's a lot of slightly sobering lessons. Now we have time for a few questions, I think. Uh, so would anyone uh, care to raise a question? I'll bring a mic to you. I'll start with Andrew and then uh, one for Cam. Maybe introduce yourself as well. Thanks, uh, Thank you, Tim. Uh, uh, professor, um, I'm uh, Andrew Gunter and uh, uh, one of the trustees of the Henry George Foundation, which uh, assists the, uh, the organisation of PROSPER uh, over many years. I wanted to, to inquire if there was any uh, thread that could be historically established between Stamford Raffles introduction of some of the pre-Georgist principles, very, very pre-Georgist principles in the uh, early 19th century and the decisions that were made in the 1960s uh, to introduce more, uh, if you like, better formed Georgia's policies in land use uh, from that point onwards. I think, I think when uh, Singapore was founded as a British trading post uh, way back in 1890, I think the idea was that the central area would be planned by the government and there was this in, um, interest to actually get other landowners into the, the immigrants and landowners into the system and so land titles were actually sold uh, for large tracts of land for plantation purposes. We had lots of plantations in Singapore and in the central area was relatively small. So it was uh, very much a British system of um, land titles, freehold, 99 or 99 years leases and um, and it was only upon, um, at a point of independence that these drastic changes in land use laws were introduced. So um, I would say that when Singapore became independent, we inherited basically the, uh, a, a system, a legal system that was left to us by the British co um, colon uh, colonial government. It went, it went down to the master plan um, format, the uh, land titles and uh, what could be done with land. But um, they left us with this idea that this whole could, was a possibility and uh, much land was actually allocated on this whole by the British government as well. Um, but it was, I, I think the state, under the state land rules that were Im implemented um, under the new government, the maximum leasehold length of 
uh, would be 99 years or shorter. Um, yeah, so we did inherit that tradition and we actually uh, made adjustments along the way uh, to enable more rapid growth, I would say. Yes. Terrific talk. Thanks, Sok Yong. I, my question, we, you mentioned earlier that HDB is doing some work internationally and that there, there are pilots going on in other countries. Are there any examples you've got of where some of the foundational ingredients in the scheme have been adopted by other countries? Uh, I think the HDB gets many visitors uh, throughout the year because uh, there are many countries that want to study uh, the HDB and, uh, and our CPF system. Um, and I think many countries actually in the 1970s were interested in the housing pension, in a, in a uh, pension fund for housing, the you know, house, housing pension fund system. Um, Mexico, I think, adopted it um, from the 1970s onwards. Um, Hong Kong, Malaysia all had their yeah, pension funds, funds for housing. Uh, recently, I think uh, China, oh, China also adopted it when it was uh, privatizing their uh, housing sector. And more recently, Indonesia has also adopted a form of uh, pension, uh, housing pension system. So the housing pension system part is the, actually the relatively easy part of, of the system. And uh, governments were kind of interested in getting uh, access to compulsory savings for development purposes. But it's a HDB part that is actually quite difficult to replicate. HDB does so much in terms of town planning, amenities, uh, planning for all the, the facilities in each town, uh, and integrating with the other agencies to provide infrastructure. So the HDB component is relatively difficult, um, but the HDB also had actually an offshoot. Um, uh, they, in, an, in, in 2003, their planning division, the building and planning development division, uh, became so-called uh, corporatized and uh, is now under Tomasic Holdings, which is a government-owned uh, holding company, and so, uh, it's called Sabana Jurong. So Sabana Jurong is basically a consultancy company and has been building townships, I think, in various parts of um, the world, in China, uh, in China and India in particular. So they are kind of exporting the Singapore-style townships and the expertise they acquired over the decades to other countries. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, my name's Emily. I'm on the executive committee here at Prosper Australia. I have a question that it's about the actual units themselves, because um, many of us live in a range of different kind of housing here in Australia. Um, some of us live in, you know, sort of standard suburban homes. Some of us live in different kinds of apartments. Some of us live in straw bale houses. Some of us live in stone castles. Um, so my question is, HDB are developing houses, uh, flats. Um, is there a kind of diversity in the offering or is it uh, a relatively standard architectural style? Um, is the government's program, the HDB, are they able to cater to a diversity of preferences beyond home size, I suppose, is what I'm asking. I, I think um, the, the basic home types are um, the two room to five room. And then there is a, a much more smaller proportion of larger types, such as we call them multi-generation flats, executive flats. But they are all high density. And from the outside, it's just blocks of flats. <laughs> so in, in terms of diversity of house types, there is very little um, diversity. By diversity, but in terms of architectural form, I think more recently we have seen um, HDB willing to actually um, to experiment with different uh, design, uh, as in executive condominiums is a way of kind of privatizing the design of uh, uh, condominiums to uh, private developers. Then there is a design uh, build sell scheme which was, was supposed to be um, we will privatize that the design of these flats to private developers for them to handle, the, uh, including the sales part. But it wasn't very successful because in the end, there were too many complaints about the private developers and <laughs> HDB actually <laughs> and, uh, stopped the scheme. 
but they have been actually inviting a very well-known um, local, as well as foreign developers, to design some of the more recent uh, iconic um, HDB flats through design competitions. And some of the very high prices have been fetched in the HDB resale sector are to do with the fact that these are actually um, winners of design awards. Yeah. So there is increasing diversity. But in the 60s and 70s, no, we were just trying to, <laughs> to, to build housing for everyone. Yeah. Uh, so Kyung, my name is Brendan Coates uh, from the Grant Institute uh, Think Tank based here in Melbourne. Thank you for a, a very informative presentation on the HTB scheme. Every time I hear about the HTB scheme, you're left with it, I'm left with a sense of what could have been in a world where we um, democratised, you know, the land rents that came from development of our cities. The challenge that I find when I look at the Singapore model is that. Um, Singapore had the foresight to capture those windfall gains, the rents, before they were generated, before economic activity took off. In, a, in Melbourne, in Australia, you know, land values are expensive because people have purchased, the, people are capturing those land rents, but many people have purchased those, that land at market prices with their own labour or other capital. How have you seen a system or what, what advice would you give us if we wanted to introduce something like HTB in Australia? What's the, have we seen systems where we've captured those windfall gains but it, and captured those land rents, but in, in, a, in a mature market, in a world where those land rents already exist versus in a model like Singapore where much of the development took place subsequent to the creation of the scheme? Um, I think the most recent case I'm aware of is in Hawaii, where um, the state, a state senator was very interested in the Singapore model, and they, are, they have actually passed legislation to enable a pilot of the Singapore model. And the idea there is to use state land. So the state land would be used rather, you don't have to acquire the land, and, uh, and I think there are quite a number of states which already where the state already owns a um, uh, large proportion of the land. In, uh, in Seoul, uh, in Korea, I think the idea that Seoul will have to actually increase its housing supply very quickly to let the government to actually acquire large plots of land on the suburbs of Seoul to build these large townships, which enabled housing supply to be ramped up very quickly. I think it was one million units over a, a decade. And, uh, and so various countries have actually used um, land acquisition, right? It, especially grow, uh, rapidly growing cities to facilitate housing uh, densification and housing development. Um, when it comes to more mature markets, I mean, these are all East Asian cities that were actually uh, growing rapidly and, and needed um, the, uh, the quiet land for that purpose. Uh, when it comes to more mature markets, I always wondered about how the land values from the skyscraper value, uh, re revolution that we have had, um, who did it go to? Um, and I think uh, there are some papers about how skyscrapers really took off only in the 1970s in, for, throughout the whole world um, because of some technological uh, change that facilitated um, the engineering of uh, uh, skyscrapers. And when you look at the data, you say, well, where did all that land value go to? Did these cities that are all in mature economy have in place um, betterment tax systems, for example, that enabled the government to uh, recoup part of uh, the increase in land value, the tremendous increase in land value from having a 50-story, 70-story building that, that is built. So um, I, I found that actually most cities didn't have a, a transparent system of uh, regulating who captures that land. So the fact that, I mean, in, in 1964 already we had implemented a development charge to um, capture the betterment uh, value uh, for, from private landowners, and that now is widely accepted. It is at 70%, and the system is now um, regularized. There is, I mean, the private, private owners enjoy 30% of that increment to incentivize the redevelopment. About 70% of the in increase in uh, density and or from rezoning is captured by the state. So that is, a, that is a 
possible solution without having to do land acquisition. You know, we are providing the incentives for densification, for building higher, for building more, but at the same time, the, the government is able to capture part of that land value to provide the public amenities that are required um, for that particular development as well as for other infrastructure. So uh, I think retirement tax systems, um, I mean, the, the discussion has been uh, ongoing as to what's the best way to implement those kind of tax systems. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, Rob Gordon's my name. Uh, I hope you can um, uh, spend some time with our uh, housing minister here and planning minister. Uh, we've got a few uh, minor problems that uh, you could look at. 3.3 million in poverty. Uh, the fact that it's you who... Uh, immoral to own a worker's home. Um, the top 10% here should be paying inheritance tax and the tax-free threshold should be 48,000. Uh, we need to scrap super, which is a disgrace according to um, uh, Alan Kohler, and give workers uh, their super as a deposit uh, and uh, stop investors and foreigners uh, buying dwellings on the same day. We can <laughs> easily be done. <laughs> so we have one recipe and we have another recipe for housing affordability. I don't, I don't think too many people in the room will disagree with all of that. Okay, I, I think we'll draw it to a close and thank you everybody for your, your fine questions. I, in relation to Brennan's point, and uh, as we took Sokyong through Brisbane and Sydney, a lot of Sydney siders were surprised to learn that the ACT has a betterment tax system that will capture 75% of the land value uplift from rezoning. So we can also learn lessons from closer to home too, I think. We have a model. Okay. Thank you very much, Sok Yong. Uh, it's been our pleasure to host you this week. This has been a fascinating talk on such a different institutional structure for achieving the kind of goals that we all share at Prosper. So please, would you put your hands together to thank our uh, keynote, Sok Yong Pang. Thank you, Sok Yong. We're going to have a quick word from our president, Catherine Cashmore, and then you may stick around and join us, uh, join us for a drink afterwards. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. Uh, I'll pass you over to Catherine for just a moment. Uh, very formal. Thanks so much, everybody, for uh, joining us. Uh, our annual event is our biggest event of the year, and uh, we're always so delighted when the hall fills up um, and uh, we have such a, a wonderful speaker that... Um, Thank you so much for your, for your contribution tonight. It's only a very quick word. <laughs> I haven't got a big speech prepared or anything. But uh, we're a very hardworking organization. We run with a very small staff and uh, a volunteer executive panel. And we work very, very hard to produce the reports that we do throughout the year and to bring events like this to you. Um, and we exist really on uh, your donations and your membership. And this is just a request and a beseech, really, for you to continue your very generous support, to spread the word, please, to your family and to your friends and acquaintances that you meet to bring our work to their attention and uh, just let them know that, that um, you know, just, just bring to light the, the word of Georgism and spread the word of Georgism out there. As, as Gareth so eloquently put it, it really is an apt time for our message to get out there and uh, it, the you know, the media is taking hold of what we've been saying um, over the years. So uh, thank you very much for coming this evening. Enjoy the rest of the evening and uh, please, yes, uh, support our work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, everybody, for coming. We hope to see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.